So several weeks ago, I was approached by Paleo Curiosities on Instagram and asked if I would like to take part in a collaboration. He wanted to create a theme week where I, along with other content creators, would talk about different animals that interest us that share something in common. And if you follow me on social media, or if you've read the title of this video, then you already know what the common theme is for this week. Now, I recently talked about how air sacs allowed dinosaurs to become the biggest animals on land. And it also allowed some species to gain the ability of flight, eventually leading to the birds. But flight is expensive. When you see a bird or a bat flying through the air, you're watching an animal that has devoted a huge amount of its biology to that one act. Everything else that the animal does has to work around the fact that its body has to be built to do that one thing. However, in the case of gliding animals like a sugar glider, they only have to have two things to achieve what they do. They have to maintain light enough of a body weight to not drop like a rock, and a membrane with a large enough surface area to carry its weight on the air. It's just a tiny possum with a built-in parachute. The ability to glide is something that has evolved independently several times throughout Earth's history. This was once thought to be a predecessor of flight, and although in some cases this might be true, I think the idea of it being a transitional step on the way to flight underestimates how useful gliding is in itself. Gliding can, in a more heavily covered environment like forests, be every bit as viable as powered flight at a fraction of the energy cost. And I want to talk about some of the most unique and bizarre animals from across history that had evolved this way of getting around. So this is my top five most fascinating prehistoric gliders with a side of Triassic weirdness. When I first started researching this list, I wanted to include at least one gliding mammal before I got into the really wild stuff. We see three different groups of gliding mammals today. In the past couple decades, we've actually found fossils in China that suggest that mammals were capable of doing this as far back as the Jurassic 165 million years ago. In fact, the earliest example of a mammalia form that could glide was actually somewhere in that gray area, a missing link between the stem mammals and the true mammals called cynodonts. Called Maya Patagorium, this creature was one of the last of its kind. It's thought that it lived similarly to the gliding lemur, the Kalugo, gripping the trees with its long fingers and crawling along to avoid predators. But if it got cornered, it had a secret weapon. During the Middle Jurassic, the dinosaurs had gotten to the point where directly competing with them was becoming an impossible issue. For a long time, we believed that the mammals simply hid in the shadows and avoided the dinosaurs, and a lot of the other synapsid groups simply died out. But we see now that although our ancestors were at a disadvantage throughout the Mesozoic, they were still diversifying into different niches and evolving some pretty cool strategies for avoiding them. The first specimen of Maopetagorium was found in China in 2017, and a second closely related species was found in Russia in 2019. Some of the fossils of this creature are so well preserved that we can clearly see the membrane that stretches from the head to the front limbs and in between the front and hind limbs, and then from the hind limbs to the tail, giving us a very clear view of this early ancestor of mammals ability to glide. In my last video talking about the strange animals in the Triassic period, we talked about the Drapanosaurs, a group of pretty bizarre reptiles that evolved for an arboreal lifestyle, with claws like a tree-climbing anteater, a head like a bird, and a prehensile tail like a chameleon, with a claw on the end of it of all things. It definitely earned its spot on my list of weirdos from that time. But it seems that somehow in the evolution of this group, it's like nature looked at this design and said, how can we make this even weirder? And the answer was apparently to do whatever was going on with the back half of this thing's body. Hyperonector is a species of Draponosaur that was discovered in New Jersey. And because of its weird tail that appears almost paddle-like, and the fact that the original fossil was found at the bottom of an ancient lake, it was originally thought to have lived a very different life than its relatives. It was thought to have been a swimmer. In fact, that's exactly where the name Hyperonector comes from, which means deep-tailed swimmer of the lake. No complete specimens of this creature have ever been found, but literally dozens of partial skeletons have given scientists plenty to speculate with. With all this data, despite the name, the aquatic hypothesis has pretty much been tossed out. 
Scientists now believe that Hyperinector was arboreal like its relatives. But then the question still remains, why did it have a tail that looked like this? Well, one of the more controversial theories is that this thing may have been used for gliding. But unfortunately, there has yet to be any fossils found showing this for certain, unlike in our previous entry, so the jury is still out on this one. But hey, any opportunity to talk about another Triassic weirdo, right? So I'm counting it. So I know a decent chunk of my audience was growing up in the early 2000s. And if you grew up during that time, and you have an interest in the stuff like the subjects I talk about here, chances are you're familiar with the next animal on this list already. Remember Primeval? Remember Rex? Well, if you do, his species is the third animal on this list. And if you don't remember Rex because you never saw this cult classic show about British scientists traveling through portals to the ancient past and encountering prehistoric animals, not you, then allow me to explain. This is a Solora cerevis, a species of basal diapsid reptile from the late Permian. It was part of a group of animals called Weagletosaurids. And this was, as far as we know, the first group of reptiles to take to the skies at all. This species was discovered in Madagascar, and it was believed to have been an insectivore that lived in wetlands environments. They've often been compared to the Draco genus of gliding lizards from Southeast Asia today. However, in a 2011 study, it was shown that Solora cerevis may have been much less efficient at gliding than the modern Dracos because of them being too heavy. It's still believed that it could glide, just not able to pull off the aerial acrobatics that we see Rex doing in Primeval. Instead, it could probably glide about as well as a basilisk lizard could actually run on water, going about 10 to 20 meters in a straight line, with younger individuals being lighter and able to go farther. Which is still pretty impressive when you consider that we're talking about an animal the size of a green iguana. I should also note that the Draco family of lizards is not a direct descendant of these guys. Just another case of convergent evolution. For number four, we have a tiny dinosaur that had a lot of people bamboozled for quite a while. It's still only known from a single specimen that preserves most of the skeleton along with long display feathers on its tail, which is where the name Epidexicteryx comes from, which literally means display feather. I know a lot of these names are absolute word salad when you look at them. This animal was first described in 2008, and at the time it was unlike anything else known to science. It was only around 25 centimeters or 10 inches long, it had big eyes, teeth that protruded out slightly in the front, long arms and freakishly long fingers, and a short tail that ended in long ribbon-like feathers that gave the animal its name. Scientists looked at the strange combination of features and concluded that this dinosaur lived very similarly to a modern eye eye a nocturnal relative of lemurs that lives in Madagascar. And I guess I can see it. Eye eyes also have large eyes that allow them to see in the dark. They climb trees and use their super sensitive hearing to listen for insects inside of wood. And then they use their long fingers to dig and probe for its meal. So paleontologists took this exact strategy and copied and pasted it onto Epidexicteryx. And this was the version of this animal that was shown in the 2011 documentary Planet Dinosaur. The issue with this description came up in 2015 when another closely related dinosaur called Yi Chi was identified. It was from around the same age as Epidexicteryx and was concluded to obviously be a very close cousin. However, the way that it was positioned and preserved gave us more insight into what this group of animals was really like. And this discovery would blow the Saurian eye eye idea wide open. In addition to being covered in fluffy feathers, the fossil shown Yi Chi had a membrane of skin that extended along the arm and stretched in between the long finger bones. This wasn't a dinosaur eye eye, it was more like a dinosaur bat. It's now believed that this is, was a group of arboreal gliding dinosaurs, because the surface area of the wing probably wasn't big enough to allow for powered flight. What's really interesting is that this type of wing structure that had been previously seen in animals like bats and pterosaurs had never been seen in dinosaurs before. And this was a group of dinosaurs that, from the moment that they were discovered, we knew they had feathers. But it appears that they were not serving any use when it came to taking to the air. Finally, for the last spot on this list, we have to go back to the Triassic to check out another one of those weirdos. 
because of course we do. Let me know in the comments if you would like me to create an ongoing tier list of Triassic weirdness. Now even though we see a lot of wild experimentation in evolution during this time, we also see the beginnings of a lot of different groups of animals that will come to take over the world during the Mesozoic. However, this animal is definitely the former. In fact, when I did my list of Triassic weird animals, a lot of you asked why I didn't include this thing in it. Because if ever there was a crown jewel of Triassic butt babies, it would be Charovipteryx. And, well, I'm glad I didn't, because now I get to talk about it here. Known only from a single fossil found in Central Asia in 1965, it was originally given the name Podopteryx, a name that means foot wing. However, the name was changed in 1981 after scientists realized that the original name was already assigned to a living damselfly. Now, because we only have one specimen of Charovipteryx, we don't know if it had a skin membrane on the front limbs as well as on the hind limbs. But a study done in 2006 suggests that if it did have a second set of wings, it may have been one of the most efficient gliders that has ever existed on Earth. And if not, it would likely make it a very limited glider, incapable of controlled gliding. Personally, I don't know how to feel about the subject. On one hand, I tend to believe that nature doesn't make mistakes, so surely the most efficient option is the most reasonable one. But at the same time, the fact that this is actually the exact opposite of the structures used by literally every other gliding and flying animal that has ever existed makes me wonder, if this was the best way to do this, why wouldn't we ever see this set up in nature ever again? I talk all the time about how whenever there's a winning strategy in evolution, convergent evolution will often recreate the same thing multiple times in unrelated species. So who knows? Ultimately, this creature will stay a mystery until more fossils are found or more fossils of close relatives are found. What? Good God, it's related to Tanning Strophius. I'll deal with you next time. And with that, we come to the end of my list of the most interesting gliders in history. It's really fascinating how many times the wheel can get reinvented into different forms when a strategy for survival has undeniable benefits. All five of these creatures evolve the ability to glide independently from one another, as well as independently from any gliding animals around today. So it's definitely a successful strategy that I really enjoyed researching it in more depth. I want to thank Paleo Curiosities for including me in this collaboration. I'll be including a link to his Instagram in my description, as well as any others who are taking part in the Gliding Animal Week. Or if you want, just hop on Instagram and search for the hashtag GlidingApril2022. And don't forget to check out Keenan's video if you haven't yet, since he'll have his out already by the time I release mine. There's like 50 Ozymek outside. Oh? I don't like them. They look at me funny. Careful, Tim Tim. They're related to Tanny Strophius, so they might be Piscivores. I don't care, I can take them. Tim Tim, don't roll around! Oh crap. Alright, guys, I gotta take this. Have a good one, everybody.